Have you ever thought about how the way you treat the performance of others might lead to the risk of ethical misconduct? Turns out the connection may be closer than you think. Tiffany Archer is the Regional Ethics and Compliance Officer for Panasonic Avionics. In this episode of Moments of Truth, we sat down and talked about how when people feel things are unfair, the stage is set for behavior nobody wants. Take a listen. Tiffany Archer, what a delight to talk to you. Um, you're somebody whose uh, ideas on ethics and ideas on organizations have inspired me, and I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with you and share with readers uh, and listeners some of the great ideas you have that will help, I know, help them be more honest. Mm. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate yeah. this opportunity. Yeah. So, Tiffany, one of the things we found in our research was that when organizations, when their actions and words match, when um, they say this about their brand or their mission, or they have a, they're purpose driven and this is their purpose to serve a greater good. Um, when those actions and wor words actually match, the company is actually three times more likely to have people tell the truth, behave justly and fairly uh, and with equity and do the right thing. Right. But when those words and actions don't match, when it's just a campaign, when there are um, words that are not mirrored in employees and customers' everyday experiences, you're now three times more likely to have people buy, cheat, and serve their own interests. When, what have you seen in terms of companies that, e even with good intentions, say things about themselves? Um, how, how have you seen people actually try and actually live them or struggle to? Mm. I would say, as far as the, the struggle to component of it, I think that when there's a disconnect between like you said, when an organization or a company lays out its strategic path or goal, um, and there's a disengagement between the understanding that what the employees have of how to either get to that goal or how they'll be rewarded if they put forth the effort to obtain the bigger goal. Once you have that disengagement, um, I think that's when it's it's fraught for you know everything to go awry. You know, there's there's no connection. So now you have an, an issue of do I remain loyal or do I channel my loyalty to my peers who are on my level who I speak with all the time. We have the same level of understanding. We have our common goals and those goals seem to be things that we can obtain, achieve, and maybe even exceed, right? So we'll keep our privacy and our secrets amongst ourselves. Um, if we have to cut corners or maybe, you know, not necessarily act as ethically as we know we should, um, we're going to do it anyway, because when we try to move towards the bigger goal, we're not rewarded or we're not informed if our actions aren't kind of moving towards the trajectory of that, you know, intended outcome. But we're noticing that on the lower level, when we're amongst our peers and we kind of keep it in our inner nucleus, um, that's when we see what we want, the outcome that we want to achieve. And I think that's kind of part of the problem, right? That lack of transparency and then the disengagement, which makes people feel like I don't need to be honest about things because when I keep those mistruths to myself or if I hide a little bit of what's going on in the way I've orchestrated a particular, um, you know, path forward, I'm, I'm going to do better. So that's what I'm going to do. That is so fascinating, Tiffany. So for the leaders who are holding the bigger picture goals and, and aspirations of the company, what is the work? So that I, I imagine that disconnect that you're talking about is, it's much easier to create that actual connection, right? It's, it's almost right. like a default mode, right? I'm going to gravitationally pull toward what's familiar and who I love and trust. Right. What do leaders have to do? What's the work to build that bridge and make that connection? And then what's the work to sustain it? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think step one is knowing, I mean, a lot of people say this, but knowing your audience, you need to know your stakeholders. You need to know what their fears are. You need to know what their concerns are. And you need to communicate down things that are realistic. And I think in their, in their language, in their words. So how you speak with middle management would vary with how you might speak with um, individual contributors. But I think the first thing is developing that connection because through that connection, that's the first step towards trust. Um, I think then there's you know, ongoing communication. So if there's a problem in the organization that might thwart whatever that bigger goal was, or if there is an issue that might be uh, course correcting, you know, for example, now with the pandemic, many organizations are going through a lot of <laughs> internal changes, probably their you know, bottom lines have now you know, changed, their targets are changing, everything is different, budgets have been diminished, uh, or layoffs are happening. So there's a lot of change, right? And I think the transparency there, letting everyone know all the way down the line, 
you know, here's what's happening. Here's the reality of what's happening. Here's the potential consequence of what's happening. And here's why I need you to continue to partner with me so we can get to the other side. So I think it's about forging that relationship, continuing to reinforce that relationship, whether that's through empathy, you know, one-on-one -on -one talks. But I think that ongoing communication um, all the time is, is incredibly important for leaders to do, particularly, you know, in a moment like this one. What's the difference? What makes the difference between the leader that's received as a, I'll trust you now because you've been honest and authentic and whatever, versus the leader that is received as, you're reading a teleprompter, this is what you were told to say, you're, you're, you have a talking head, but you have no idea, you don't know who I am. Right. How do they, how do they traverse that gap? and end up on the right side of the relationship? I mean, I think a lot of it is about checking in and measurement, right? It, it takes a lot of proactive effort. So like you mentioned, the tick the box notion. And, and, and I think that was a great point that you made, you know, whether they believe that they're really doing it, whether it's intentional, you know, that they, they think they're doing it and so, that, so, the, so they are, or is it that they're just ticking a box? Um, I think that to, to, to close that gap between the leader who is truly engaged and as seen as someone authentic, genuine, and can be trusted versus the one who may be perceived as kind of not as much, in, not as engaged. They need to really, you know, put their, themselves into the environment. I think they need to, and, and, and develop a means of measurement. I think they need to see how they're being perceived, whether that be through a survey, whether they try to get feedback from various levels of leaders on the ground to understand what the outward perception of that person is, but it takes, it takes work. And I think some leaders um, think because they're a leader inherently, you know, they're at that level where they are trusted, you know, they, they control everything. So it, it should be good because they, they're doing things with good intentions and the greater uh, outcome of, of, of helping the organization, you know, it's all goodwill, but it's more than that. You know, you have to actually, you know, walk the talk. <laughs> and so part of that walking, I think, is truly walking, like get out there. Are you seen? You know, are you really communicating the message on the level that people need to hear it? I think a lot about communication is about making sure that your message is understood by the recipient and that takes tailoring. And okay. then that's also another level of work. Again, a lot of leaders are busy. Um, I personally believe in transformational leadership style. So for me, I think that you want to bring people in, you want to empower others, you want them to feel part of the whole. And that, again, takes proactive work, it takes integration, um, and it takes actual communication, not just spouting words, but making sure they're heard and making sure that it's resonating. And to the extent it's not, you know, take a few steps back and say to yourself, how can I change the way I, I speak with you next time? Like, what, what do I need to say or how do I need to package this so they really hear me, right? Because you need them to hear you for them to think twice before they misbehave or if there's a misconduct or think twice before they actually say, I need to come forward and share something with you, I'm a bit concerned. What have you seen in terms of leaders being able to create an environment in which people will speak their minds and people, people are gonna be comfortable telling you the truth? What have you seen leaders do to de-risk truth telling? Mm. I, I, I think I've seen you know, several approaches. I think one of the ones I've seen um, that's been, been impactful is, um, I mean, it sounds pretty rudimentary, but um, you know, reinforcing the notion of, of not retaliating and actually living that. So leaders who share stories about maybe times where they were in a challenging moment and they in their career had to decide to come forward, you know, despite whatever that consequence may be. So I think living through story um, is really, really helpful. And showing that when you come forward with the truth and you're being, um, the purpose of coming forward is to try to effectuate change or to reveal something that you know might have a greater, more negative impact, you won't, you won't be harmed, right? So that, I think that notion of like, you won't be retaliated against, but telling it through a story and through your own personal story, whether it's a leader who has been posed with that challenge or maybe has colleagues or fears, I'm sorry, colleagues or others um, who have had that experience, I, th I think that's really helpful. Um, I think also, again, it's about pillars of trust. Like, I think that if you don't feel that you can understand why coming forward would be a benefit to you, why coming forward actually means that it's going to protect you going forward, not just even, you know, monetarily from your pocket, but it helps your team, right? Or it helps your, your broader function. And also from a, from a leadership example, I think that leaders also have to show on each level that find the person who you can go to, right? Who you can 
trust with this information if you're not comfortable going all the way to the top. I think the other problem is some leaders want transparency and they want people to come forward, but they don't, the environment seems very scary and there's oftentimes so many levels. And I think also the fact that much of the time, I would say in my experience, I've seen the problems lie kind of at the individual contributor level or on the ground, um, the people who are kind of like the smaller on the, the lower part of the totem pole. So there's a lot of fear, I think, as you escalate level by level. And then as you escalate level by level, there's less transparency. Those people don't know the judgments that are being made. They don't know what's going on in the boardroom. They don't know, you know what the management might be doing as far as reorgs um, or furloughs you know, or staff reductions. So I think the, the transparency needs to kind of go both ways. And I think to the extent the transparency is going upwards, meaning that leadership is allowing those in the lower level to understand to, what, to the extent it's not confidential, what they can going up the ranks, then I think you'll see more information flow up. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do you coach leaders to understand what retaliation means? That it's not just about, you know, you're not going to fire them or lay them off or transfer them to Siberia. How do you help leaders understand all of the reactions that employees fear that define retaliation? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that, again, that comes down to empathy and connection. I think leaders need to be mindful of the fact that there are gradations of what someone feels is, is to be retaliation. And like you said, it's all the conduct. It's anything that makes someone feel um, scared or feel fear. Um, and I think also it's really important for them to, to be aware of and cognizant of the fact that they need to build this rapport because it's just going to be an ongoing issue that just bubbles up and bubbles up and rises and they're never going to have people trust the process. Um, so I think, again, it's about leaders kind of being in the trenches. It's about leaders being mindful of themselves, like taking an introspective look about their own reactions and behaviors to people's responses or information. And I think also it's like about facial expression. It's about body language. It's, it's not just okay, I, I didn't fire you, so you're fine. I mean, people need to be reassured, right? That you came forward, you were honest, and for that, I commend you, and I'm, I, may, I may even reward you, right? Whether that's through public acknowledgement, you know, letting others know, listen, person X, that, that's actually something I've seen in a lot of companies, they, they do rewards where, whether it's through a program on maybe the, their intranet, they'll, they'll do like posts about the person, and oh, hey, they were very helpful to us, or, this person, you know, we're shining a light on person X, you know, because they were, they came forward, they trusted the process. So I think also, you know, public declarations of why coming forward doesn't mean you're going to be harmed also helps assure them, right? And that they weren't fired. Not only were they not fired, but they were rewarded and recognized. So talk about how do leaders, um, how do they not reinforce divisional tribal loyalty? but actually create loyalty to a bigger thing. Like, but how have you seen people do that so that I don't feel, I don't get to the place where I, you're, you're, tell, you're leading me to not care about you. How do you, how do they just do that? Mm. I, I think the best way and what I've seen, I mean, kind of, I, I touched on it a bit with the performance review, but I think people have to feel that their contributions, their honesty, trust involvement is required for the, broader organization to stay afloat. So I think leaders can't only reward one group, you know, choose one group over another, mm -hmm. give more flowery, you know, commendations to one person over another. Everybody has to be, I think, held accountable to the ultimate bottom line of that organization. And so if that leader doesn't encourage that, doesn't enforce that, doesn't drive that, that theme and, and, and tone and tenor home, I think that's what causes those divides and it can't be, it's, it's irreparable, right? So I think, again, it's about proactivity. You need to be on the ground involved and you need to actively, you know, state and explicitly state, you know, what is required for there to be success. You can't have success if you have all of these disjointed people with different beliefs, different measurements, different feelings about how they're uh, appreciated and, and if they're not appreciated. And you can't have you know, some people being lifted up and others kind of staying dormant and flat. I mean, there has to be, it has to be a level playing field for all and all have to feel like you know, we're all working towards the ultimate outcome that benefits the broader organization. Tiffany, a delight. Uh, I knew this would be an exciting and really richly insightful conversation and I was 
exceeded my expectations. So thank you for your insights and uh, thoughts. And thank you for your good work in the world and uh, keep it up. Thank you so much, Ron. We've all ignored that person holding the sign or looked away as we saw someone emerging from their tent. But what if instead of turning our senses away from those on the margins of our communities, we pursued them? In this episode of Everyday Justice, Jared Chappelle talks with Ruthie Kim, founder and CEO of Because Justice Matters, on how the simple acts of touch can bring others dignity and restore justice to a community. Take a listen. Hello and welcome to Everyday Justice. I'm Jared Chappelle. And in this segment, I'm going to be introducing you to people and organizations who are doing the daily work of dignifying and advocating, and really fighting for justice. And today is great because with me is a friend, somebody I met probably 12 years ago, Ruthie Kim, and she's going to be telling us about Because Justice Matters. Thank you so much for being here and being a part Thank of this you. today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, you bet, you bet. Well, Ruthie, I would love, I mean, I think we met probably about 12 years ago mm -hmm. and I would just love for you to kind of give us a bit of the Because Justice Matters story. Where did the idea came from? What moved in your heart? And then kind of, you know, what is the work that you do and what does it look like today? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, well, anyone that's listening can probably tell I wasn't born in America. So um, originally born and raised in the UK, small, tiny little village, rural community, and uh, moved out to San Francisco um, about 21 years ago now. So um, yeah, quite a while ago, I came out initially to do a very short stint with like a faith-based nonprofit. And uh, I'm still here, apparently. Um, I moved to the Tenderloin, actually. So um, if people aren't familiar with San Francisco, it's a low-income community a lot of homelessness, drug addiction, a lot of challenges. And uh, I moved there, I was living there and working there for a number of years. And during that, that period, I started to meet women. And I started to make friendships with women and build relationships with them and began to observe mm -hmm. some unique challenges that they were having, um, some obstacles in their life. Um, started to learn that the women were, you know, disproportionately more likely to experience poverty or be victims of domestic violence. They were vulnerable in ways that, that men weren't when they were living on the street. Um, they, they really lacked options. And I just began to see, wow, this is an intense need here. And women are really under-resourced and, and under-cared for in San Francisco and, and I wanted to do something to respond to that. Um, I, I met women on the street who had their kids with them on the street. Um, I met women who had been um, addicted for decades or trapped in exploitation. And I just thought, you know, we've got to do better. Like we've got to, um, we've got to reach women in their really unique circumstances. So about 12 years ago, I launched Because Justice Matters. And um, it really, it was actually initially out of going through some training to become a domestic violence advocate, mm. and just started to realize, wow, this is something I'm passionate about. And I want to respond to and we started real small and we were doing outreach on the street. Um, we were painting nails and I can talk about that, but um, just started making more and more connections and, and over the years we've grown and, and now we serve women and girls um, in the heart of San Francisco. It's amazing to me that, you know, the, you know, you talk about it kind of like on the streets, just meeting women. Um, yeah. I feel like a, a big part of what, what because Justice Matters has done and what you're so good at is listening to like where the where the pain actually is, where there is hurt, where there are wrongs that could be righted, where justice could be served. Um, you have justice in the name of your organization. I mean, I'm curious for you, you know, what what does justice mean to you? How how would you describe that definition? And I'm curious if it has changed at all in mm -hmm. over the course of these 12 years. Yeah, you know, to be frank, I think when I chose it, I probably didn't really understand it. Um, <laughs> to be completely honest, um, I think it's a word that has been thrown around a lot over the years and yeah. it sounded really cool. I think um, 
like probably many of us that have dreams to do, you know, important good work like we start off with an idea and as we go along we begin to learn and grow mm. and like oh and we're changed and the vision changes mm. and and that's kind of been my journey but you know I think justice is thrown around a lot and it, it does mean different things to different people for us it because justice matters justice is really about the process of restoring something back to its fullness so mm. whether that's a person or whether that's a community, what we wanna do is the work of what does this person or this community, this family look like at its fullest potential in mm. all of its fullness and what is hindering that? And that's the injustice. Mm. And so identifying where's the injustice, what are the obstacles, what are, what's the unfairness, what's the inequality like, and doing the work to try and dismantle that and move that aside and then helping women move forward you know our mission statement we talk about building pathways to brighter futures for women and girls mm. and we have just this really deep belief that there is a bright future for women and girls and there are mm. real valid obstacles that are preventing them imagining that and accessing that and so we want to do the work of justice we want to do the work of dismantling that and moving those obstacles aside and helping those women and those girls on that pathway to their bright future. I love restoring people to their fullness so yeah. much. Uh, it's so good. What a, what a great way to describe what justice means. It's it's so, it, that can be so individual, but certainly so systemic. So I, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the nail days earlier. I think that was one of the first places where I connected with, was with Because Justice Matters was at a nail day. Um, you do some things like nail day. I know you've done dance classes and I'm sure there's been a host of other things over the, the 12 years that maybe if I looked at, I would be like, what do you mean justice? What do you mean? <laughs> What do you mean um, restoring fullness? Like you just put some polish on some hands. I know it's not just that, but mm -hmm. I'm just curious, you know, how, maybe some stories from those days and how you see those small moments as something that can be really dignifying and liberating and actually bringing that justice that you imagine. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people would look at the neighborhood where we've done a lot of our work um, and they could recognize there's a significant issue of poverty happening. And I think when we use the term poverty, people often, they think about, you know, lack of finances, lack of resources, and it absolutely includes that. But uh, because justice matters, we also think poverty includes the lack of relational connection, lack mm. of community. Mm. And so in the early days, what, what I started to see as I was working with women was that it was impossible for them to even imagine a bright future because they felt so isolated. They were so disconnected. They didn't have family. They didn't have those really, that, that framework, that support system around them. And so it was hard for them to imagine like, what could a bright future look like? How could I access that? I think all of us could agree that, you know, none of us can reach our potential. None of us can kind of move into the, the things we want to do in life by ourselves. And yet time and time again, I met women and they were so isolated and, uh, and so disconnected. And and so what we think at BJM is that community is the opposite of poverty. We believe that mm. as we come around and we create connection and what we call transformational relationships, that that's actually where change happens. And, and so when you connect with women and girls, they feel valued, they feel seen, and that's when they can begin to make steps towards that bright future. And, and so what we did is just like, how do we create spaces where transformational relationships can start? and it's two-way mm -hmm. like I, you know I hopefully impact their life they impact my life significantly um, and the first place we started that was at a nail table and and so very early on we we literally pulled out a table onto the sidewalk and just said hey does anyone want the nails painted and and yeah it's fun like women love to get their nails done but it was actually what happened at that table that was where the gold was at it was that moment of connection and that space where like women could talk and they were being heard to maybe for the first time that month you know like mm. they were sharing and someone was listening and there was like really healthy touch happening that mm -hmm. was just affirming that they were valuable and so that was the beginning and then since that for the last you know 12 years we've just been creating spaces 
where these relationships kind of ignite. And so then it, you know, became a dance studio with girls and yes, girls come in and they learn to dance and they grow in self-esteem and confidence, but they also find community. They find mentors and peers. And, um, and then we just started replicating that in all these different spaces. And, and so, yeah, what we do is, is a little bit different to maybe what, you know, other nonprofits are doing, but, but I think it's necessary. I think women and girls need community if we're mm -hmm. gonna see them move forward in their life. I am so grateful for you. I'm so mm -hmm. grateful for your, your life's work. Um, and BJM, thank you for sharing that with us. And um, we just look forward to BJM's future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jared. Yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, Ruthie. Bye-bye. The fact is that people want and need to be held accountable. But what's needed are processes that focus on dignity of people as unique humans and contributors. Leaders should be less concerned about the uniformity with which they, that process is carried out. Their attempts to neutralize inconsistency have ended up neutering individuality, resulting in a dehumanized version of accountability. Ironically, accountability should be the most inspiring process in a company, the one that honors an employee's unique contribution and motivates them to become even better. Unfortunately, today's approaches to accountability are more designed to avoid like, litigation through documentation and eliminate a company's liability exposure. They have removed far more individuality than they have variation. And that's exactly what makes them unfair. The good news is, it doesn't have to be this way. Making dignity and justice more central to our accountability processes would allow two very important things to change. First, the connection between contribution and contributor could be reestablished. In an economy of ideas, and insights, we can no longer say things like, it's not personal, it's business. Or, I have to evaluate the work and results. The value of subjectivity has significantly risen as the contributions people make have increasingly become reflections of who they are. Their creativity, their analyses, their imaginative ideas. Thus, accountability becomes fair when managers grow the unique talents of their employees as individual people with the realization that cultivating someone's abilities is as important as the fruits of those abilities. Accountability has dignity when it requires assessing and honoring the integration of unique contributions with their contributors. Fairness no longer equals sameness. At the core of accountability with, with dignity must be an honest, caring relationship between a leader and those she leads. Till next time. Keep leaning into your moments of truth so that you can be the example of what it means to be honest.